Welcome. Today we have 39 participants, 40 now. In the last uh, iteration, the first one we had 41, and uh, we had a high of 53 last time. I was expecting with EWS graduated and everyone else preparing to get out of here and finish their last papers that we fall into the 20s today. So 40 is a great showing. Very happy with that. Um, I'm now putting up a screen to share with all of you. And I think it's beautiful. Anyway, as Wick probably should have pointed out by now, this is the final scene of the end of Om where the unfortunate General Mack is surrendering his army to Napoleon. <laughs> Um, great resolution. How did you get such good resolution? I don't know. I just lucked out. <laughs> anyway, I am, this, this will take the OM campaign uh, almost day by day. We're not going to spend a tremendous amount of time on most of these slides or just see how the armies are moving. And then we'll go into the uh, Battle of Oslitz for the last three or four slides where we can get into a little more in-depth discussion. But most of this will be about the campaign, and then it will turn into the battle itself. Uh, okay. So here, let me show you what we, we have set up here. This is 1805. Napoleon has his entire army, or the bulk of the Grand Army, assembled up near Boulogne, the camps in Boulogne, where they've been there for two years, training, getting ready for the great invasion of England. To pull off this invasion, he's got to get the, the Navy, the fleet out of Brest, where it's blockaded. He's got to get the fleet out of Toulon. He's got to take over the English Channel for at least a period of a day so he can get his army across the channel. Obviously, the British have blockaded them in Toulon. They're blockading them in, um, in Toulon and in Brest. And they're trying to make sure that they cannot link up with the Spanish or it will not be easy. France's ally in this war is Spain. Against France uh, is Austria. And you can see their armies forming on the edge of the Bavarian, Bavarian border there with uh, Archduke Charles mostly interested in Italy. And uh, the Russians marching across Poland at this point, trying to get to their allies' aid in, uh, before the French can attack. So Napoleon learns all about the uh, Austrian mobilization and decides, well, I'm not going to get to England anytime soon because my Navy is still stuck in port, hasn't gotten into the channel, and sends it marching. He's, and we'll, um, we'll talk a whole bunch more about this actual march. The things I want to point out is how far he's got to go. He's got to cross the Rhine. Can I, can I add something, Jim? Yeah. The, the army camped at Boulogne was really becoming a, a standing joke and a source of embarrassment for him, uh, especially since it was called the Army of England until he mobilized it to go, to go east to the Rhine. Everybody knew he wasn't going to be able to cross, and keeping the army there and having it named the Army of, of England was, was a running joke in the army itself, and he was kind of relieved that he could now get out of this embarrassing situation. Let, let me add to that, Michael, but by the way, it's, I'm delighted to meet you because I've always I've loved your work. Uh, um, uh, I don't think today, um, since- Well, thank uh, you, sir. I've always been a big fan of you. More about uh, Napoleon than you do. I, I, I think one of the striking things about this, though, is that Napoleon's intelligence compared to the campaign we discussed two weeks ago is far better than the German intelligence about what's coming up um, what the nature of his enemies are, what their potential um, um, lines of operation are, and how he needs to address it. Um, compared to uh, um, the Germans of 1941, he looks like a rocket scientist. Uh, <laughs> of course he was. I mean, there's simply no doubt that there was no, there's been no um, superior operational commander in the history of the world, except maybe Alexander and Alexander, we really don't know, I, I would argue, enough to, to compare him to uh, Napoleon. Uh, the thing about the Austrian intelligence at this time, a lot of people think that they sent Archduke Charles, their best general, 
and their biggest army to Italy to reclaim their lost possessions in Italy. But according to Austrian intelligence, they believed that Napoleon was going to launch a third Italian campaign. So they sent their best general with their biggest army there. And uh, as it turned out, there was no third Italian campaign. Okay. So I'll just add on to that. You can see Archduke Charles down there with almost 100,000 men. He's going to Italy. And to stop him, Napoleon has arguably his best generals, best general. There's, you know, as many arguments about who Napoleon's best marshal was. And who's, uh, who's the best um, um, marshal or general. Uh, so usually it comes down to Salt, Messina, Deval, and Linus, maybe if he didn't get himself killed four years from now. In the uh, Lon was a battering ram. It usually comes down between Massena and Davu. I like both. But this, uh, sending Massena and the Army of Italy is a great example of the economy of force and not uh, distributing your, your combat power to non-essential theaters. I mean, yes, it's 50,000 men, but it wasn't a very good army. So, of course, the other part is from the Austrian point of view in terms of, of uh, a bad piece of intelligence thinking um, is, is the idea that Napoleon would uh, do something, uh, um, uh, a simple repeat of the 1796 and, and later campaigns in Italy and, and 1799 campaign, um, when in fact, of course, if you looked at the deployment, um, of the French army in, in uh, the summer of 1805, the only place they were going to go was Germany. Right. And that is, uh, you know, just another example of uh, generals and statesmen being able to convince themselves of their preferred option. Uh, I'm gonna <laughs> break the flip side, Wick, if he had conducted a third Italian campaign, how foolish would the Austrians have looked? He did it once, he did it twice. <laughs> Why not a third time? True enough. I'm going to break the storyline here for a second to tell one of my favorite Napoleonic stories, and it has to do with leadership. Messina does an outstanding job in Italy, and we're not going to cover hardly any of that, but he, hold, he, he basically repels Charles' assault and um, keeps Charles from really doing much of anything to influence the battle around here. And Charles is probably, that's a little arguable, the best commander the Austrians have. But Messina does not do so well much later when he faces uh, Wellington up in uh, the Torres Verde lines in Portugal. And when he re he's been he's been rewarded for his previous by being made a a, a Duke of Essling, uh, Prince comes, Prince of Essling, Prince, Prince of Essling, my mistake. And when he comes home, Napoleon looks at him. He has he wanted to retire. Yeah, he doesn't do anything Napoleon wanted him to do. And Napoleon looks at one of his best marshals and said, the Prince of Essling no longer is Messina. And then you're not a very good general anymore. And then Napoleon was left to wonder after an insult to his honor and pride, why Messina didn't come running to his aid in time for Waterloo. Anyway. Uh, well, Messina got a raw deal in Portugal. He had two corps commanders who didn't respect him, Ney and, and Renier. Uh, Renier was a was a strict Calvinist, and he resented the fact that, that Masséna would parade around his mistress, and Ney was just pig-headed and wouldn't take orders from anyone but Napoleon. Mm -hmm. And uh, really, Napoleon placed Masséna in a, in a no-win situation. And it's a shame because his, his reputation did die on the lines of Taurus Vedras. Right. I, I, on the other hand, I mean, again, the, the problem, of course, is that the other great general in this war, uh, is clearly Wellington, um, uh, that we're talking far off of this campaign, because Wellington hasn't even emerged as a serious military figure in 1805. Um, but, but Wellington, um, uh, again, everything I've read about the uh, lines of Torres Vedas created an absolutely impregnable position. Um, uh, and here you get the huge impact of the uh, Royal Navy in the fact that logistically, Messina could not be supported in Portugal. Um, right. Unless he had um, a naval way uh, of, of supporting, which of course he didn't because the Royal Navy both blocked him off and supported Wellington's army uh, so they could sit at uh, Torres Vedas and watch the French. And when the French finally retreated uh, 
I believe Wellington just refused to attack them. He said, uh, let him. Yeah, well, he let him starve. He let him sit there and starve. Quite possibly the lines of Torres Vedras were the very best defensive lines in the history, uh, in military history. And compound that with the fact that the whole region is a desert. Um, the French starved, plain and simple. Okay. We'll move back now to the all 1905 campaign because we can talk about the campaigns in Spain and Portugal all day. Maybe we'll save that for next year's session. This is based the basic plan. You can see the three Russian armies marching. I'm not even going to try and pronounce those names. Kutsov. Bucks Howden and Benningsen and Kutusov. Thank you. Um, uh, you have General Mack marching across Bavaria. You have Charles um, marching across Italy. And you have John, who's going to close the Alpine passes there. You have a British the reason Russian. why... Archduke John, uh, I'm sorry, Archduke Ferdinand and Mac well, uh, Bavaria was because Bavaria was a French ally at this time. Right. And even though Archduke Charles warned Ferdinand and said, look, you're going to be amazed at how fast Napoleon moves, Mac and Ferdinand were like, yeah, well, we'll worry about it when the time comes. Yeah, again, what's astonishing in terms of um, by 1805, given what had happened to the Austrians uh, um, in the 1790s against Napoleon, you would have thought that the one huge worry in their mind was precisely that, how fast Napoleon could move, which, you know, is every mark of the 1790s campaign um, in Italy, where basically uh, um, with a foreign inferior force, he manages to consistently outmaneuver them outspeed them, put them in impossible situations, continually beat, beat them up. Um, and yet here we have in 1805, them basically paying no attention to the fact that if Napoleon moves, he will move like a, a, a rattlesnake. The strike will be, you know, something almost impossible to stop. They actually, the Austrians actually believe that, that, uh, Kutuzov would have plenty of time to arrive before Napoleon reached the theater. Of course, they were using the wrong calendar. Well, that too, but they didn't expect Napoleon to show up until November. We'll, 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 we'll talk about a lot of that as we progress on. This shows you the basic setup. Notice the Bavarians are not backing the Austrians. We're going to talk about that in a moment. Lannis's corps is there as pretty much an observation corps, and the rest of the army is going to march from Boulogne. Mark Mamont is going to march from the Netherlands, and Bernadotte is going to march from whatever that is, where you can see it. Hanover. Hanover. Doc Murray. Go doctors. Like all people. I don't see one who's retired. All right, I muted that person. You're not. Well, I, I think one of the significant things about, of course, the uh, movement is is the de degree of extraordinary planning, operational planning that Montgomery, uh, that not Montgomery, uh, Napoleon sets in motion uh, um, when he decides to move uh, east, which is he lays out virtually the entire scope of the plan, um, partially depending on Austrian movements. Um, which by the time he gets to the Rhine, he's still able to tell units where they should be and who their commanders are and, and uh, where they fit into the plan. Okay. So Napoleon actually, when he makes the decision to move, dictates his order. And uh, the, the guy who d he dictated to, his name escapes me, um, wrote out, who is it? RTA. Yes, that uh, he, it just came flowing out of him in one long uh, stream of consciousness. Now, of course, Napoleon was famous for putting his seven-foot map down and crawling along on it on the floor and uh, tracking each corps, you know, with a protractor to see how long they can march. Anyway, here's a setup here. The Grand Army is composed mostly of veterans in the War of Revolution. Some regiments as high as 80% of their troops have been te our 10 year veterans. The training, even though they were being made fun of at the balloon camps, is pretty intense. These are first class tr soldiers, lots of time combat experience, and even more, and made better by hard training while they're waiting to invade England. 
we already talked well, about a lot of people don't that. appreciate is the type of training the type of training is is combined arms training and that's what a lot of the old regime armies were lacking at this time the interplay between the three branches and that's what makes the french army special and, and what unique is what are we this is napoleon yeah, let me add to that, Michael. I think one of the crucial points before August 1805 is Napoleon had had three, oh, years, uh, three years to do Napoleon. combined arms training so that uh, um, the uh, Grand oh, Army, when it goes east in, in August, September of 1805, has had three years of training in terms of, uh, quote, the invasion of England. Um, but in fact, far more important is the training that Napoleon had been able to give them over that period uh, from 1802 to 1805. And it's for some, even even earlier, the Army of, of England had been up there since the War of the Second Coalition in 1798. In fact, the Napoleon had expected, inspected the Army in 1798 and found it wasn't ready, and that's why he went to Egypt instead and took most of his Army of Italy with him to Egypt. So there were some units up there that had been there since 1798 training. And I believe Mike hit on one of the key factors here is the organization of the army into corps, the corps that can march separately and fight separately. And if they get into trouble, um, we're within marching distance of each other. So it was, it was separate to foot to march and eat and um, live off the land, which is a big change from the armies of the previous century that brought depots and lived off a, a huge logistical train. Um, so, um, so we got the St. Cyr as guard of the Papal State. You have Messina. It does not show line. It does not show Linus on this map, but he's there. One thing that the Austrians were counting on was that the Bavarians would be on their side, and I think they were counting the the Electress of Baden to bring her husband, and she's one of three princesses that are married. One's married to the Tsar. One is married to the. Uh, Ruler in Bavaria, and um, I forget what the other one is, that they're going to, that Bavaria is going to welcome the Austrians, and their 22,000 troops are going to welcome the Austrians. General Mack makes a tremendous error um, when he actually starts marching because he doesn't wait for the Austrians to say, uh, for the Bavarians to say, it's okay, we joined you. He crosses the Issa River without their permission. And that forces the, that, that drives the Bavarians into Napoleon's hand. That Jim, there really was no, no chance that the Bavarians were going to side with the Austrians. That, that was a pipe dream. <laughs> and quite frankly, I've never heard that. Uh, this is one of those well, areas Bavarians, where historians are going to disagree, but I, I have to bend to, to the... Bavarians have, of course, a long tradition of supporting losers. Um, uh, in terms of <laughs> well, this the, time they supported... In the Spanish succession, they were, you know, signed up to uh, support the French and got whacked by uh, Marlborough. And, and uh, uh, basically, uh, unlike the Prussians, they had consistently made both long-term strategic um, faulty choices. And once again, uh, uh, here they had made a faulty uh, strategic choice in, in deciding to... Uh, Back to the Austrians. No. All right. Well, the exact opposite. This time they got they went with Napoleon. Um, they pulled out of Austria. They crossed the Danube to link up with Napoleon's armies, twenty two thousand strong. Uh, one other thing I like to point out here is this is a this is a very different army than it was just months before. They've got a whole new regimental system that was really imposed within days or weeks of the army marching, and it's still, all get, it's still being reorganized as the, as the war starts. Um, as Mike has already mentioned a little bit here, General Mack, Gen Ferdinand, Prince Ferdinand is the, is the, uh, r the ranking member of this force. But his dad, the Habsburg Austrian em Emperor, says, yeah, but you have to take orders from Mack, General Mack. And Mack is not considered by anybody a general's general. He's, he's, he's. he's uh, That's not true. He was, he had a very good reputation. Okay. Very good reputation going into this. It's, this destroyed his reputation. Well, he has a reputation as an organizer, correct? Yeah, but an 18th century organizer who did well in the field, not just a, a, a paper pusher. 
He lost an army and got captured his last time out. This is his second time being captured at the end of Ulm, right? He escapes. Yes, but he gets like I said, he escapes. Um, a, a lot of this army is new compared to Napoleon's veterans that are marching hard now, and you can see that on the left hand side. Um, many of the Austrians have never even fired a, we a weapon in practice. Uh, whole corps, whole regiments, I'm sorry, are being given six rounds to shoot during the march so that the men can learn the very basic procedures of how to fight. And you can see up there, we're now at 10 September and the army of the, the Grand Army is on the march. The Austrians- Jim I, Jim, Jim, I think one of the crucial things if you look here in terms of the coordination that Napoleon was to, to bring to this operational movement is look at how far Bernadotte and Maumont are off of the movement of Davou and Soult and Ney um, to the south. In fact, if you look at that, er that earlier map you showed of, uh, of the West Point Atlas, you see them all formed up within um, two or three weeks into this great wheeling motion. Uh, but this is, this is in terms of movement, logistics, and planning a brilliant piece of coordinating disparate forces into one sort of coherent um, uh, wheeling motion, which destroys the Austrians. And I fully agree. And I think we're going to see a whole bunch of that in the next few slides. So as I already mentioned, the Austrians crossed the Issa without Bavarian permission. They also brought with them wagon loads of cash. Unfortunately, the Austrians had changed out their currency several weeks before, and all of the cash was useless, couldn't be spent anymore. And the Bavarians immediately figured out that the Austrians were trying to pull a fast one on them. And unsurprisingly, food and everything else you need to live off the land suddenly starts disappearing. The Austrian army is on low rations long before Napoleon ever gets there. And that's, that's made much worse by a logistics train that just wasn't ready for a march and starts to break down very, very quickly. I have two circles on this map. One is Anne's back because the other is Black Forest. Mac is absolutely convinced that if the Napoleon does not come through Sicily, he's going to come through the Black Forest and that he could be sitting there in Ulm on the other side of the Danube, ready to slaughter him as his regiments and his divisions come marching out in, in some sort of uh, linear order. He believes this because Ansbach is Prussian owned, Prussian controlled, and he doesn't believe Napoleon will risk having Prussia come into the war in his rear areas by marching through Ansbach. Um, he, he basically leaves his entire right open. Now, I have a thing here that says that Ferdinand, the nominal guy in charge of this army, has told him, Napoleon's going to march onto your flank. Do not, do not go to Ulm. In the earlier Napoleonic fights, Ulm was a great fortress, not Napoleonic, the Wars of the Revolution. And uh, the, the Austrians did a very good job in these late 1790s holding their positions along there. And I believe they've become entranced with the idea of Fortress Ulm being unbeatable. And it, especially if attacked from the front, when the front is the Black Forest. And Napoleon knows this. He tells General Ney, Marshal Ney, you know, demonstrate, demonstrate, make it look like I'm coming through the Black Forest. Convince him of what he wants to see. And uh, Ney does a pretty good job of that because he is totally convinced. Here we are at another, um, another uh, West Point map, which everyone loves. And you can see what Rick Murray was talking about there is all the cores because of the exquisite timing and planning of Napoleon are approaching the Rhine River at exactly the same moment uh, or very close to it. Bernadotte closing up from the north. You see the... Uh, here, the Austrian, the Bavarians moving out, getting out of the Austrians' way. You can now see on the far right here, Kusinov. It's 25 September. He's arriving with a, with the first of the Russians. There's two more armies behind him. They're marching at the blistering speed of six miles a day, carrying their logistics and their trains with them. To go faster at this point, the Teshin, um he, he says, I'm going to leave, you know, leave the baggage. We're going to march faster. And they eventually get up to a blister, a, a, a respectable anyway, 12 miles a day. But he's already lost 30% of his troops on the march. 
and he's going to lose a lot more as he approaches Vienna. And with mention of Wick has, I don't know if this is real or not, but it comes up all the time and it's a planning nightmare. One of these armies is on the Gregorian calendar and one of these armies is on the Julian calendar. And the uh, nine day separation was not taken into the planning. So the Austrians always fought the Russians from their notes that were dated were much closer than they actually were. That's so true. There's a lot of evidence that the, the notes, you know, that they, that that's not, that's, that's not actual. The dates may have been different. And, but uh, when you say I'm sending a letter from Teshin, the people in Vienna know how long it takes a note from Teshin to get there. They could, they could do that extrapolation. <laughs> But, you know, Jim, there is a sort of larger point here, which uh, uh, sort of one of many, which is that you should understand the other uh, in terms of your allies as much as understanding the other, the opponent. Right. Um, and, and, and the Austrians uh, didn't, which given the fact that they had cooperated in the late 1790s is somewhat surprising, but maybe it's not surprising given sort of the capacity. Well, the result of that cooperation was a disaster. Tsar Paul pulled out of the Second Coalition and, and was actually contemplating an alliance with with uh, Napoleon. The, okay, but just so everyone knows, this is the war of the Third Coalition. The first one pretty much ends uh, with the Treaty of Amiens in what, 1809? No, no, Treaty of Campo Formio in 1797. Yeah. Right. Treaty of Luneville in 1801 ended the Second Coalition. That's and the Treaty of Amiens ended the war between Great Britain and France in 1802. Okay, that's, that's, that's the one I'm familiar with. Great to have an expert at my disposal. I should have you sitting in my class. Um, all right, this is the same day. I'm just showing you a more close-up map of where the Austrians and the French are. The next day, the French start crossing the Rhine. Napoleon sends a note to his brother, we're all crossing the Rhine today. Napoleon stays at Strasbourg for another four days, planning and making sure everyone stays, you know, on their March schedule. You can see um, the basic lineup here, Kienemeyer, Alfenberg, lining up along the Danube and the rest of the troops to the south. Not much to say. It's now five days later. The French continue to march. Not going to add much to that. It is now five more days. The French march is now closing. And you can see now that this is a great wheel coming straight at the Danube. And the Danube is here, Ingolstadt, Donauwerth. Nothing is coming out of the Black Forest, which is here. You can see that there's divisions and corps lined up to stop that. Nay, has spread his troops out. This doesn't give a fair approximation of how much room Ney's cavalry was taking, um, but they're, they're making all sorts of demonstrations to convince the Austrians that they're gonna come through the Black Forest. Don't look at that major, that huge army marching into your flanks and rear at this point. Jim, can you go back to the uh, 25 uh, uh, September map? This one or this one? That one, 25 September. Okay. Oh, either one, it doesn't matter. Napoleon didn't learn until the, the 20th of September that the Austrians had actually not waited for the, for the Russians and had uh, ventured out of Austrian territory. And um, e even at that point, he didn't think that they were gonna move any further. And uh, like I said, until the, to the 20th, uh, on the 20th, he found out from uh, a report from Yura written on the 18th that the Austrians were, were approaching Ulm. So up until, you know, the 18th, 19th, 20th, Napoleon really didn't know where the Austrians were. So that's, that's what helps organize this great wheeling motion because it, the Austrians kind of fell into it. Had, had the Austrians stayed, you know, in Austrian territory. It w there was no way to have, have conducted this operation uh, the way he did. So it, it really fell into his lap. Uh, yeah, the Napoleon, Napoleon probably would have won eventually anyway, but it would have been a much harder fight had not Mack right. actually put his army into the, jo the closing jaws of a massive 
uh, encirclement operation. One thing I did forget to mention. No, but let me, let me add, Jim. Jim, right here, what you're de what you're dealing with is Napoleon's incredible capacity, like a rattlesnake, to see an opening that the enemy has created in terms of when the intelligence comes in that the Austrians were deploying forwards rather than waiting for the Russians and the move on the with 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 lightning speed. Right. As opposed to the Austrian situation, which om in which um, Mac gets intelligence about what's beginning to form against him in early October and does nothing about it because he it doesn't fit with his preconceived plans and therefore he dis dismisses it, which is, I think, again, one of the great weaknesses of, of bad generals is the fact that they tend to take, um, if you will, their preconceived notions and try and make reality fit it, as opposed to Napoleon, where when his his preconceived notions um, probably were that he was going to fight in central Germany a much nastier battle. Um, but when the Austrians make the kinds of mistakes that they make, he moves like a rattlesnake. And the issue here is is first class military organizations, um, uh, which never get exactly right what's going to happen, adapt to reality and change assumptions. And weak military organizations try and make assumptions fit preconceived notions. There's a, a hand, uh, in the archive, there's a handwritten memo by Napoleon himself. Uh, there's no date on it, but, but most people think it's dated between the 22nd and 24th of September. And what it shows is a, a very, uh, a much deeper turning movement um, than he actually had to, had to do. In fact, what we'll see as Jim goes on with, with the maps, is that the French are going to be so far behind the Austrians at home that they're not going to believe it. They, it was just unbelievable to them. They're going to be 100 miles east of Ulm. Uh, that's because Napoleon, from the, from the start, had this preconceived notion of a, a great turning movement. And uh, by the Austrians moving to Ulm, it just, it just made it that much easier. Right. Uh, the one thing I forgot to mention on this thing is that the it, it, Around the 25th, the Prussians also start mobilizing. Maybe they, they, they're a little confused themselves. They do have an army of observation watch, watching the Russians march, so they don't march into Prussia or across Prussia. They did. France, France, um, France, Napoleon pretty much buys them off by promising them handover after the war. Uh, there's a lot more that goes into it, and I'm simplifying all the diplomacy that's going on at this time. But uh, the Prussians decide... No, we're not going to go into the war in 1805. They do enter the war in 1806 when they no longer have an Austrian ally and the Russians are lick, still licking their wounds. And that's a story for another day how Napoleon's Grand Army blitzkrieged across uh, um, Crusher and took them out of the war in a matter of weeks, really. Well, the, the uh, just, just for the sake of clarity, the Russians did um, violate. Uh, Prussian territory, and the French did as well by uh, Bernadotte right there. He's going to cross through Ansbach. So the Prussians didn't know who to turn, who, who to make war on. But, but the Prussians are also playing a very dangerous game of, of let's see who's going to win. And when the winner comes up, because he probably won't be, win big, we'll be able to step in and make really big pieces, which of course is why when Austerlitz occurs, the, the Prussian ambassador shows up the day before, and Napoleon having already gotten what he's going to say, um, and uh, Napoleon fends him off till Austerlitz is over. Um, but the Prussians were clearly planning to jump in um, on the side of the Austrians and the Russians, uh, thinking they were going to win. But again, they're playing a very dangerous game, which is we're sitting on the fence in a very dangerous situation, and we're going to wait and see who wins, and we'll jump. Um, on that basis. And they finally decide in November that the Russians and, and uh, Austrians are going to win, and it's a disastrous mistake. Yeah, there was a very moving scene uh, at Potsdam where Tsar Alexander uh, made Frederick William III and Queen Louisa go to the, go to, uh, the um, tomb of, of Frederick the Great, and there they, they supposedly sealed their friendship and they signed the Treaty of Potsdam in which Prussia pledged 180,000 men 
uh, man or army to join the third coalition unless Napoleon did X, Y, and Z. So like you said, Wick, they sent uh, Hogwitz, the uh, ambassador, and Napoleon wouldn't see him. And as soon as Auschwitz was over, uh, Napoleon said, oh, Monsieur Hogwitz, well, you wanted to see me? And that's the beginning of the end for the Prussians. Diplomatically. Uh, anyway. Here we well, are at 7 the October. The law comes in uh, at, at Jena Auerstadt, where <laughs> they show unbelievable military incompetence. Even right. make Ohm look, uh, um, uh, Mac look good. Okay, here we <laughs> Here we are. Well, that's the story for another day, but that's where the French really showed their superiority of combined arms doctrine over an arm over a typical 18th century army. I hope you all noticed how close I came to getting past Jena Ostat without having to talk about it. But, uh, <laughs> but now we're back. It's 7 October. The, the French are crossing the Danube. The Austrians have put themselves almost into the trap. Ferdinand is say, realizes this. He's begging Mac, pull out, pull out, you know, run. So Napoleon is prepared for four options, and they're listed there. I think prior to getting to the Danube, he expected that the Austrians would come north with the Russians at the same time, and there would be some sort of battle north of the Danube. Failing that, he expected that they would line up along the Danube but the major crossing areas and defend it tenaciously. Don't let him get across with his entire army. The other option they may have had, and I don't think it's a good one, <coughs> is <coughs> that they would uh, cross into to Tyrol and get down into Italy, where Charles's army was. But that would just open a straight march to Vienna. So I don't know, I don't think that's a realistic option. The last and the one I think he expected once he got to the Danube was that the, the Austrians would run for Vienna and his hard marching Grand Army would overtake them and destroy him before they could get there. The one option Napoleon does not seem to have envisioned was the one the Austrians did. We'll just march into, up to Ulm and allow Napoleon to surround us there. The fact that that is such a absurdly dumb thing to do was incomprehensible to Napoleon's planning. He has to react on the march when he realizes what happened. And Wick already talked about this earlier, you know, how fast he could uh, turn around and strike like a snake and how adaptive he has to be even when his opponent does not do uh, anything that he expects. And the reason he has to expect it, it's, it's just an incredibly, incredibly dumb thing to do. Switching to the West Point maps now, you see pretty much that exact same situation. Um, the thing that, the thing that uh, a lot of people don't understand about this campaign is they think that Mack got his army to Ulm and just sat there. The concentration at Ulm didn't begin until the 5th of October. Mm -hmm. So as Napoleon is, is conducting this wheeling movement, that's when Mack's army is actually moving into Ulm. And Napoleon doesn't find out about this until the night of the 5th to the 6th of September um, that, that Mac is actually concentrating at all. You could see how far Kasuv has moved in the, in the weeks. Kutsov, I'm sorry. He has passed Vienna. He's within marching distance, but that's still a probably a 10-day march from where you could see Kosanov, he's crossing the Issa River. No, he's not crossing the Issa River yet. He's, um, the Issa River is here. Um, he's got to cross at Landshut if he's coming to their aid at all, but he's uh, also exhausted at this point, or his army is exhausted. This is uh, the first major fight. I don't, there's several major battles along the Danube before, uh, Napoleon actually gets surround, uh, surrounds him and traps the army there. And I don't think it's worth our time to go into each one. So if people ask me to send them the slides for this, you'll see down at the bottom of the slides of the major battles, a good website that has a tremendous maps for each of these battles and a very good description. But this is the first one. And it's Marat and Lands trying to fight off a counterattack by Offenberg. The, you know, the Austrian army, as Mike just said, didn't just sit there. When Napoleon crosses, they uh, 
they do start to react. What they're not doing is reacting with their whole army concentrating, to, you know, as they would do in Mike's books on 1813 and 14 campaigns show over and over again, the best way to beat Napoleon is to bring your entire force or as much of it as you can against one of his cores and annihilate it. Where when Napoleon is, you pull back where there's a core commander or any commander besides Napoleon, you attack with everything you have. I think that's a lesson they're still waiting to learn. They probably learn it here than at 1806. And Napoleon taught it to him over and over again. <laughs> yep, the hard way. They had to learn the hard way. Had to win. One of the things that makes Napoleon a great general is that he fought 60 major battles. I think I could be, you know, pretty good at fighting battles if I had 60 of them, 60 battles worth of experience in my uh, time. Second battle here is on 9 October, and it's Goodsburg. And um, I, I'm not going to read what I wrote there. You can take a look at it while you're looking. What's interesting here is that Napoleon, while the Battle of Goodsburg go, starts, sends Malat, uh, sends Lannis, Marat, and Salt um, towards, <clears throat> boom, this is to trap the uh, Austrian army in there. But he still doesn't know where the Russians are. He's not particularly worried about Kienemeyer's small force, but he is worried about the Russians. So Mamont and Deval are not sent towards Ulm. They're, they're pretty much waiting until uh, the, the, the Russians show their hand. And just to add to that, uh, the majority of the Austrian army was at Gunsberg. That's where uh, Mack had placed it. He had heard about the disaster at Vertigen, and um, he, he really, this is where he freezes. This is the, 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 the culminating point. This is where he freezes, and he makes no resolution. So this is, this, this is the day that doomed the, the Austrian army, because he does nothing. The next day, after Napoleon learns on this, this battle's on 9 October, on 10 October, he writes his brother, I have defeated the army, I have the army surrendered at Ulm. They were defeated yesterday by Ney. Napoleon now knows for sure that he is going to capture an entire Austrian field army. Well, it's not the entire Austrian field army. They still had guys and uh, elsewhere, but again, it's a huge, huge success, um, uh, which reflected, uh, um, as Michael said, the inability of the uh, uh, of the Austrian commander Mack to recognize when the si situation was getting out of hand and do doing something about it. Um, I think you know, certain point like Gamla in 1940. Uh, certain generals, when things start to go to hell in a handbasket, freeze up and can't make any decisions. And Mac made no decisions. Right. Um, in fact, there were a number of Austrian commanders urging uh, a pullout and a, a, a retreat. But uh, Mac was, was frozen psychologically. If I may add a, a little bit more to that, um, you know, Jim was just talking about Napoleon fought 60 battles. But this is the first time that Napoleon is actually commanding an army this size. Um, he had never commanded something more than, than 50,000 men, maybe even less than that. Um, and, and this really is, he's, he's untested. This is uh, uh, his first big one. So there's a lot riding on this. And you add to that that, um, you know, he, it was uh, approaching one year since his coronation and the fact that Napoleon was the master of misinformation. So, of course, he told Joseph that he defeated every Austrian army that he came across because he wanted that to hit the newspapers. But um, a lot of people forget that, that really this is the first big uh, battle or big operation, big campaign that Napoleon fights with a, with a huge army, 200,000-man army. And, and again, I, I, I think... Um, sort of underlying what, what Michael's saying is that you're looking here at a huge spread of French forces that are being coordinated in a largely intelligent fashion, um, which shows, um, I think, an, an extraordinary mind. And there's no doubt that simply Napoleon was one of the smartest people ever to live, uh, um, certainly in terms of military terms, but a number of other ways. Uh, right. Uh, now, uh, I'll tell you what really impresses me about doing research about uh, on the French army is 
the demand uh, for intelligence, the, the, the network that, that he sets up from uh, brigade to division to core to headquarters is incredible. It's like a net. And every correspondence that comes out of his headquarters demands information. That's in every letter. When I did uh, my big book on 1813, I went through every order issued by Napoleon and Berthier for three months. And that's the overwhelming takeaway I have, is constant demand for information. It was a must. It, it was, uh, you know, like eating and drinking. It was, it was necessary. And um, that's why he, he was, uh, you know, so well informed um, of what was happening around him. And, you know, Owen Conley wrote a book years ago, uh, Bumbling the Glory. I like, uh, I, I like the late Owen Conley. I considered him a close friend. But Napoleon didn't bumble. Uh, you, all you've got to do is, is take a, a, a day of his correspondence and, and look at his demands for intelligence and, and how his subordinates responded. And you know that he, he didn't stumble or bumble. Uh, he was a very smart man. As, well, we're beyond that, uh, Michael. It's also the capacity to take that intelligence and put it in, into a largely um, uh, realistic framework, which is right. which is uh, not typical of most individuals and most uh, um, uh, generals. He always saw the big picture. Got to give him credit for that. The big picture now is. Uh... Mac is beginning to realize he's in trouble. There's a, there's a gigantic French army between him and Vienna and between him and the Russians. He does seem to make a breakout attempt. Uh, Mike said that he seized up and didn't know what to do at Haslak Junjijin. Uh, this is a great moment for divisional commander DuPont who basically finds himself outnumbered five or six to one. Sometimes it, regiments being hit 10 to one. And he puts up a heroic defense that um, convinces the Austrians they're not going to get through this way, and they pull back towards Ulm again. It's a sign that DuPont in Spain was um, did not do well. He was a good size force and uh, was court martial for it and sat out most of the Napoleonic Wars after that. And uh, um, I think he became a marshal of France in the 1830s because he supported the Bourbon uh urban return but uh there's a general napoleon that should have forgiven once because his service was in several other fights was outstanding 12 october nothing much to report the Aus the austrians are pulling back trying to get into um they're not well fed they're sick um their organization's starting to break loose ferdinand wants to escape by himself or with, you know, a couple of thousand cavalry troopers. He eventually pulls that off. Kienemeyer says, sees the best uh, um, option here. The bravest thing he can do is live to fight another day. Um, you can still see Bavaria, uh, the Bavarians, Bernadotte's Corps, Deval, Mamont, uh, watching for the Russians. Salt has not moved yet. Salt. Salt. I'll never get that right. Salt begins to move, devout Bernadotte and the Bavarians stay in place. We're now- I, I, Can I add just one thing about, um, about Mac? On, on the night of the 11th, he finally really realized what was happening. And he wrote a, I guess a request to Archduke Ferdinand to move north and uh, hit a place to, to a place called uh, Heidenheim. Okay, Heidenheim, I'm trying to find, it's not, it's not on our West Point Atlas map, but um, it's about, um, let me see, about 55 kilometers north, northeast of Ulm. And he wanted to fall on Napoleon's line of, of communications. And nobody could find Archduke Ferdinand. He, he couldn't be found anywhere, so, the orders were never approved, and the 11th turned into the 12th, and it was too late. Hmm. Probably too late anyway, but okay. I, I, I just don't see the Austrians being able to move fast enough to, to react to Napoleon at this point. Probably not, but you got to give Mike a little bit of credit, maybe just a little. 
And the reason why I, I say that is because I wrote a chapter on uh, the 1796 campaign um, a year ago. And when he took command in, in, of Austrian forces in Italy, I, I clearly stated, this is not the unfortunate General Mack of 1805. He had a very good reputation, blah, 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 blah. So um, he had it in him, I think. He just, uh, he just didn't, didn't know what to do. It was overwhelming, like, like uh, Wick says, getting hit by a rattlesnake. Okay, uh, this is another West Point map, shows uh, distance. The reason I, I bring it in here is you can notice that Kusinov during this entire encirclement has stopped. His army's exhausted from its long march and he's in no hurry to cross the, cross the uh, get up to the Issa and cross into this battle. You can also see a second Russian army is now approaching the theater of war and there's a third one marching in behind that. But the, you know, the Russians are a long way away from where they can make any major impact on what Napoleon's going to do. Napoleon, of course, knows Kusinov is in the area. He just doesn't know where. And that's why he still has three corps watching that side of the fight. That's right. Of course, one of the reasons why the Russians are so far back is that it took them so long to make the decision uh, to make the alliance with the Austrians and to cooperate against Napoleon because Alexander I was not overly enthusiastic about participating in this war. Right. Um, until eventually they got into it. Right. No, he had, he had other issues on his, you know, on his plate, the Balkans, uh, Persia, and so forth. Um, so he wasn't uh, very um, gung-ho about getting involved in this war, but unfortunately, once he got involved, he gets too involved and as Jim will probably tell us the, the night of Auster, the night after Auster Litz, he's standing under a tree crying. <laughs> I won't tell him that anymore. <clears throat> as you can see Schwarzenberg and uh, Ferdinand have escaped from the own pocket. Now it shows core and division things. That just shows that those are that level commanders. They're, they're escaping with a tiny little remnant of the force. Most of the of the uh, of this particular field army is now trapped in Ulm and will very shortly surrender. It's gone, 17 October, okay? Now we're gonna take a little side tour. 17 October, Napoleon sends Marat to chase the regiments. The Russians have hardly moved. Napoleon has captured a field army, not all of the field armies, but he's captured a significant sized field army. And then less than a week later, he loses the war. Hmm. A lot of people forget this, that, you know, at Napoleon, the highlight of his operational victory over an Austrian army, an army he has defeated more by marching than by fighting. The Battle of Trafalgar happens. And from that point on, England is invincible. England cannot be invaded because they will never be able to hold the English Channel. No matter how many victories Napoleon wins on land, Perfidious Albion, as he calls the British, is out there building diplomatically, financing coalition after coalition to defeat Napoleon. So in, in operational terms, he wins a great operational victory here. He also wins a great tactical victory, which has tremendous operational um, impact and strategic impact on Central Europe at Austerlitz. But in the grand strategy or at the highest level of operational warfare, he has lost. It, well, it takes well, a decade. I, he, I've got to partially disagree, Jim, only in the sense that I don't think the French ever had a chance against the Royal Navy. It goes back to what happened at Quiberon Bay in uh, 1759, that, that, that uh, um, the Royal Navy had picked up an, a psychological advantage over the French at sea uh, that they just simply couldn't overcome. And, and Quiberon Bay is, I would argue, that decisive moment even more than Trafalgar. Um, uh, uh, the other portion, of course, it is that uh, in a larger sense for what it meant um, in terms of the Napoleonic Wars is that the Industrial Revolution is beginning to get into high gear in England and the uh, financial and industrial power 
that England is able to bring to bear from 1805 on, uh, pretty much uh, unimpeded, um, uh, given what happens at, at Trafalgar, um, makes Trafalgar a, I wouldn't say decisive victory, but, and here I'd agree with you, more important than what happens at Ulm uh, and uh, Austerlitz. Yeah, those are great points, Wick. I also just want to add some practical points. Uh, the French had newer and bigger ships, but the British had better officers, better sailors, and there was really very little opportunity for the French to train because um, where could they go to train? Where could they conduct large fleet maneuvers to, to uh, plan for, for a future battle with the British? And so it was diminishing returns to continue investing in the Navy. And uh, unlike a lot of my colleagues in the field, I think that uh, the Continental System was the way for Napoleon to go. Um, obviously, it didn't work, but really that was the only way he could have beat the British um, by, by thinking outside the box, because he was never going to beat them on the seas. Never. The, the old Again, sort of experts. one of those small moments in terms of history that, that on which um, the historic course of history turns occurred um, in 1781, where a British doctor discovered that the way to handle scurvy was with lemon juice. Nobody paid any attention to him, but in 1796, he becomes the director of sort of medical affairs for the Royal Navy, and suddenly every ship is ordered to put 25 gallons of lemon juice on every single ship, and scurvy is no longer a problem, and you can keep those ships a, um, um, permanently blockading every single port um, uh, in Europe. Okay, so for all of you who are not experts in some of the things that were mentioned here, the Battle of Kubaran Bay was 1759 and a decisive naval battle of the previous war, previous uh, major war, the, um, the Seven, Years, Seven war. Years' War, the French and Indian War, if you look at it. Hey, hey can, I, the, um, can I break in? Yes. Who? Uh, James. Okay, hey, how are you doing? Good, you I'm know, sorry. Uh, yeah, I finally got on this thing. Sorry to be so late. Appreciate it. This is uh, John Gordon, by the way, for everyone who does not know him. He is a professor at Command and Staff College. And just as a little side note, he was uh, my professor, a, a, a history professor in two of my classes at the Citadel many, many years so, ago. So obviously, John, you can take, John, you can take responsibility for Jim Lacey and I can give it up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, give give me Blucher or give me Knight. So, so since I've come late, and I, if I told y'all I'd been at work today, and nobody would believe me. But anyway, um, I don't know what the hell this is. Like I say, we're on we're on a hot spot. We're out right above Warrington, VA. This is Mosby country. Maybe that's what it is. So anyway, um, did did y'all talk about? I'm sure Bonaparte's military genius and strategic and operational. That was what I was going to ask about. But I think so, and we, you know, we'll come back to it after the thing. I, I think about two thirds of Wick's comments have been on Napoleon's operational genius. So we'll come back to yeah. it at the end of the battle scene. All right. All right. Uh, Thank you. And the uh, last thing was on that was uh, Mike mentioned the continental Cong uh, continental system, which for all of you who are not aware was. Uh, Napoleon's attempt to cease all trade between the European continent, which he controlled or controlled most of, and uh, um, and England. And Mike pointed out that he disagrees with most other historians who thought that he thinks it might have worked. Um, I'm going to join the other camp and say it never had a chance of working. But that would be for me and Mike to decide at a future date. I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to disagree with you, Jim, and, and agree slightly uh, more with, with Mike in the sense that I think it would have worked, but only if Napoleon had been willing to impose it on France as well as the rest of Europe. And that would have cost a very low, high price in political terms, in terms of the, the, the French economy, that the... the uh, the real hole in, in uh, the continental system was what flowed into France. Yeah, the smuggling and the licensing. 
Yeah, it was France was still under the continental system. It was just that most of the traders in the major, in the ports along the uh, west and the English Channel ignored it to the greatest degree possible. Uh, but we're not going to argue. Look, look is that is that the continental system was working until the British blew open New Spain, blew open the new the markets in New Spain. Right, and they were going to do that under any circumstances, and. Uh, and, the, and, and Russia proved relatively uncontrollable when it became in their economic interest to trade with England. But that's another argument for another day. We have to get to the Battle of Austerlitz. The uh, Napoleonic army is on the move. And we're going to watch it and watch very quickly here. It's closing in on Vienna. Kusinov says, well, we've already lost an army at Ulm. I'm not going to stick around to fight uh, Napoleon by himself. He begins a retreat. We're now at 5 November. At 10 November, there is a, uh, there is a battle, Battle of Durnston. Um, it's a hard-fought battle. I'll let you all read up the, uh, read on the slide. You'll get the, over, the really high-level overview of what happened. The, I, you know, I don't want to give this the idea that this is a major battle. We're only talking a core or so on each side at that much, um, but it's there. You also notice Charles has moved a little bit, but he doesn't come north to enter the fight. He still has Messina hanging on his tail down at the in the southern corner. All right, 20 November, Napoleon has Vienna. Wick, you want to tell a great bridge story here? <laughs> yeah, I think one of the sort of great moments in this uh, uh, in this war is the fact that the Murat, uh, having screwed up uh, um, uh, the week before, um, is so so humiliated by uh, Napoleon's uh, response that he simply walks across with Lanez, uh, um, uh, the, the main bridge to the north of Vienna which the Austrians could have blown up and overwhelms by himself and with the other marshal, um, the Austrian defenders who could have um, improved history enormously. Oh, come on, you're leaving out the best part, Wick. <laughs> happened was Lon and Murat get to the Tabor Bridge, the last bridge that's still up over the Danube, and they show up with a white flag and they begin negotiations and they tell the, uh, the ranking Austrian officer that there's an armistice has been signed. So the Austrian officer is duped and the French start crossing the bridge and then he finally receives word that there is no armistice, but before he can uh, have the bridge detonated, uh, blown up, the French are able to disarm the Austrians and prevent them from uh, blowing up the bridge. Well, well my, my, my point, Michael, is that the Austrians had a chance to do what uh, the Belgians had in, in August 1914 to blow Ludendorff away when he knocked on the uh, fortress of Liège by himself and with a, with a chauffeur. That, mm -hmm. um, uh, but of course, here what we're dealing with is extraordinary individuals with extraordinary chutzpah and bravery, which is why they were marshals of France. Uh, um, and clearly two of the better corps commanders. Lana is, I think, better than Murat. Oh, yeah. Well, Murat was just a cavalry commander. But the reason why I, I, I tell that story is because the Russians are going to do the same thing to Murat a couple days later. He's going to, him and Lon are going to catch the uh, Kutuzov's rear guard, and uh, they're going to say, oh, no, there's been an armistice signed. And so he lets the Russians go and finds out there's no armistice. So Napoleon once again rips him a new one. It wasn't Murat's best day. Anyway, no. we're now at 20 November. Napoleon is moving to fight the Russians. Two of the Russian major columns are there. Kienemeyer has collected up whatever Austrians are available, the remnants that got out of, uh, out of uh, Ulm. He's taken depot battalion, what they call a sixth battalion, a lot of depot troops, guys that do logistics, guys that train, uh, a lot of uh, invalid types, barely able to march. It's, it, so think of Kienemeyer's force there as a, uh, as a half broken force. Uh, Kusinov's army is down to about one half the strength that it entered the campaign when it left Poland. And the other Russian forces have already have also taken tremendous attrition 
Notice that he leaves the bow back there in Vienna at this point. Mortier is a pickup uh, core. Um, not, I, I read Kem as one of the lesser marshals in terms of capability, uh, but he's, his core there is being assembled out of divisions and regiments that have uh, been stranded for one reason or another during the march. You'll also notice that Argonau, I get that right? Ogero. Ogero. One of, personally, if you read about him, one of the more fantastic characters of the revolutionary times. He's got his corps is finally marching. This corps started way back uh, near, near Brest. Um, and it's taken a long time to get into the action. He'll, he'll do much better in 1806 than he's going to do here because he, he's basically watching the- In 1807, his corps will be wiped out for marching in a, a sleet storm um, right into Russian artillery at the Battle of Eilau. Which, which will, we're definitely going to have to do an 1806-1807 presentation with uh, Yena, Ostat, Eilau, Freeland, um, the entire thing. It's just a fascinating, a fascinating moment. At the end of it, the Grand Army is pretty much never going to be the Grand Army again. It'll be large, but it's not going to be. That's a great point, quality that it has here. Great point. Um, What's interesting about leaving Davu in Vienna is that Napoleon had no intention of taking Vienna to begin with. Right. Um, so it kind of, once again, falls into his lap because of what Lana Murad did. But leaving Davu there, Davu always gets left in places that Napoleon uh, considers to be politically important. Napoleon's going to do the same thing in 1813 and leave Davu, who I believe is the best marshal, in Hamburg all campaign the entire year of 1813 because politically and economically the, uh, that north central German area was a, a key to the continental system. Well, beyond that, it's also, uh, Michael, uh, I, I would argue that you could say that his biggest mistake in 1915, 1815 was to leave Davout uh, running uh, uh, the war ministry in Paris. Um, uh, but once again, having, once again, it's places but, but again, of political really significance. That because in fact, if Napoleon wins at, uh, uh, at Waterloo, he absolutely has to have sort of the reinforcements uh, that Davout is going to put, put in the field um, to fight the big Russian and Austrian and Prussian uh, armies that show up. No, you're 100% you're, you're correct, Wick. And this is, in my books, what I refer to is General Bonaparte versus Emperor Napoleon. General Bonaparte needed Davout with him on the field at Waterloo, but Emperor Napoleon needed a strong hand in Paris to control the situation. So just like Emperor Napoleon needed Davout uh, in the field in 1813, uh, or General Bonaparte needed him in the field, Emperor Napoleon needed him in North Central Germany. Yeah. So you have this dichotomy that it's always really impacting Napoleon's uh, st strategic and operational plans, his political concerns versus his military concerns. No, I th and I think you're de dealing with Davout very clearly, by far and away, the, the, the superior other general in the French uh, um, system. Um, uh, there may have been a slight amount of jealousy in Napoleon in terms of Davout's excellence, but I think, I, I think your point is exactly right, that, that Davout is placed in places where if some other marshal is who doesn't do it right, that the follow-on results of that will be catastrophic. That a collapse of the North German uh, framework in 1813 would have been the end of the defense in central Germany. There's, there's a great uh, letter that Napoleon wrote to Davout early in 1813 when he sent him to Hamburg. And it, ba it basically said, I'm paraphrasing, it said, you will go to Germany where you are known, basically because, you know, his reputation will, will keep the situation under control. Just like you said, another marshal, without that reputation, things might have fallen apart a lot sooner. All right, we're up to 27 November. The armies are closing in on Oslitz. Um, just showing you where it is. You'll notice that Argonaut is still marching slowly. Mortier has, has joined the bow in Vienna. Lamont is headed south. Remember, Charles has a very large army still sitting down there at the edge of the um, Italian-Austrian border. 
And here we are at Austerlitz. There's, there's a lot of things to point out here. And several of them is Napoleon's deception plan. This shows 30 November, where we're, the battle is on 2 December. Napoleon was actually forward for a little while of Austerlitz, out here where Bagration is. And he, he, he pulls out, he orders Saul to make it look like a confused pullout, that we're scared, that we're running away. He begins negotiations with the Austrians, I mean, the Russians, you know, hey, we don't want to fight a battle. How about uh, we come to some sort of arrangement? He is purposely making himself look weak. Now, um, if you look, and then, and then the retreat, giving up the Prats and Heights, makes him look even weaker. That was the key. They the the key. had the Prats and Heights, and then they withdrew from them. And um, that was key to his, his plan of deception. Um, he had uh, a Russian envoy come to his headquarters from the Tsar's headquarters. And uh, he put on this, Napoleon put on this great uh, theatrical performance where he appeared to be in disarray and he confused and, and the, the uh, Russian went back to the czar, I think it was a doctor off maybe, and he told the czar, oh yeah, Napoleon's ready to be beat, ready to be beat. And then Napoleon sent one of his officers to the czar's headquarters and, and this officer did a fantastic job uh, reconnoitering as much as he could. Um, so you really have, have, have two tales here. You've got one where Napoleon puts on this great, this great uh, theatrical production to convince the Russians and Austrians that he was ready to be beaten. And uh, you've got the French, on the other hand, going to Allied headquarters and doing a very good job of, of, of seeking or, or finding out where regiments are posted and so forth. From an operational standpoint. Well, he's, actually, it's interesting, he's also doing the same thing in, in, in a way to the Prussian, who, who instead of receiving him, uh, um, he puts him off because he knows the Prussian is going to say, we're about to declare war. Um, uh, and, and so he waits to the next day when the battle's over to, to, uh, to visit the Prussian and say, now, what, was he, what, what were you exactly going to give me? What, what, yep. what are your orders to me? <laughs> What's your ultimatum? From an operational standpoint, you got to look at what, the, what he has convinced the Russians and the Austrians of, that um, his army's in disarray, it's hungry, it's starving. He pulls off in the wrong direction. They would have assumed he would fall back on the depots of Vienna, which is where my, you can see the cursor going. Uh, by pulling up in this direction, there's nothing behind him except vast, empty land of Central Europe and a Prussian army that's already mobilizing. Um, if they can get around his left flank and push him further, Napoleon's army is doomed. It's December. It's hungry. It's been marching for a long time. The 200,000 men he started with, 200,000 plus, are down to about 70,000 at this battle. Strategic um, consumption. He's deep, deep into enemy territory. Right. He's lying communication stretch for hundreds of miles right it really was a bad situation and in a, a superior general uh than these bozos in the russian and austrian headquarters really could have taken advantage of this mm -hmm. so you know, most of you who know me know i'm a war gamer there is a lot of war games about this battle and the russian and austrian move is so foolish that the rules in most of these games have to force you to do it or, or else it, it, there is no game, there's nobody who plays a war game that would actually maneuver the way the Russians did. So they, they call it the dumb, the dumb rule for Austerlitz. The Russians have to be ordered to do certain things for the first two or three turns to make the battle look like it, anything like it originally did. Notice Bagration is on the, on the field with his army now, or very close to it. The bow is ordered to force march. Lannis, Marat, Salt, they all asked Napoleon at one point, hey, we should write, we should write, we should get out of here. Linus is actually writing a note. Uh, it's about half finished when Napoleon walks in on and says, what's going on? And he says, well, we all think we should get out of here. Uh, this is prior to giving up the Pratt's and Napoleon basically has to say, uh, we're, not, we're not leaving. Salt, who is the instigator of this, said, oh, no, sir, I'll do whatever you want. I, didn't, I never wanted to go. The other marshals, Marat, Lannis, Salt, do not know that Bernadotte's been ordered forward, and they do not know 
that the bow is moving forward. Uh, Bernadotte is probably the weakest read in the Marshalls right now. Um, just as a side note, his family still sit, sits on the throne of Sweden. He turns against Napoleon later on. Uh, he does not cover himself in glory in the Jena Austat um, campaign. And he, he, he's got to be watched very closely on this battlefield. Napoleon. He's actually, humiliated. He hum, uh, humiliates himself in 1809 fighting the Austrians again. But this map, I, I don't, I'm not sure what the map key is, but this, this map is a little um, deceiving uh, because Davu, that, Davu's core was not that close. The way Napoleon gets the, gets the Russians to attack his right is by, yes, there, that's a better map, is by posting a, a, a regiment on his right, a regiment. And, um, oh, I'm sorry, a division, a division on his right. Um, and the Vu's Corps, the main body of it is still back into, uh, back in Vienna. And Davu has to force march to get there. But the Russians see this right flank, you know, from Telnitz up to Sokolnitz, it's bare. There's nothing there. So that's why they're going to come down off the Pratsen when the battle begins. But just to add to what Jim was saying about strategic consumption, you can look at the size of the, of the core. Um, Sult is down to 17,000. Bernadotte down to 10,000. Lawn down to 13,000, Bessier with the guard, 5,300. Um, so the French army's experienced a lot of strategic consumption, loss, and so forth. Um, and it, it definitely um, was not up to full strength. And the soldiers were, were unhappy. They were not happy with being that deep in the Central Europe. The weather, well, obviously, it's December. The weather was not cooperating. And as, as Jim said, they were hungry. And... Uh, French armies are, are very hard to control. Um, once they start uh, complaining, it seems to go downhill. And I, I know Wick can talk more to that effect about the French army in World War I. Uh, let me just add that uh, in terms of how carefully um, Napoleon understood the capabilities of his marshals and um, their troops is that Davu literally arrives the night before um, uh, Napoleon's headquarters to say, my cavalry will be there um, tonight and the, and the infantry in the morning just in time. Um, right. My guess is that Napoleon would not have been taking these risks except for the fact that Davout was the uh, marshal on the point. Um, Napoleon knew that Davout would get them there. Uh, Bernadotte, uh, probably not. Lannes, maybe but Davu was the one who would get the troops there when they were needed. Well, Lon had impressed Napoleon in uh, 1800, the, the second Italian campaign. Bernadotte was still kind of an unknown uh, commodity at this point. Um, he really received more credit for being the minister of war during uh, the war of the second coalition while Napoleon was stranded in Egypt. Uh, it was Bernadotte who fed Massena the men and supplies that Messina needed to stop the Russians in Zurich and, and basically obliterate um, Suvorov's army. In seven well, here we are on the eve of battle. What? Are we going? In, I got to do one thing. Hold on. Let me let me mute this gentleman. Okay, he is now muted. Ah, uh, the. Um, we're on the eve of battle, and I'll, and I'll set the scene here. As you've all told, Davao is marching hard. He stops his army for a few hours and then be, re, and gets it started again at 5 a.m. to get to Austerlitz in time for the fight. 72 hours they march. 72 hours from Vienna to, to get to the battlefield. Friant's division is leading. It's one of the best divisions in the Napoleonic armies. It loses 50% of its force on this march. That's how hard the, the Davao is having these troops march. Saul has moved, um, name went out of my head, Legrand, it's Legrand's division to the south to hold the, uh, the, bro the, gold, the gold back br brook here with a regiment in Telenz and a regiment holding, it's not really shown well here, it's holding Skolenz Castle and the town of Skolenz. Um, Sokolnets. Sokolnets, thank you, against a um, 
a much rush, larger Russian for, Russian slash Austrian force that's going to come down off of the Pratsen Heights, strike into the into this, take it, hopefully roll up Napoleon's entire army. Uh, the rest of Salt's other two divisions, St. Hilaire and Van Damme's two divisions, are waiting down in a low point. In the morning of the battle, they're, um, they're surrounded by fog. The Russians can't see them in there. Um, these are two of Napoleon's best division commanders. The fight Hilaire puts up during the day is just tremendous. And when he's under the most pressure, when it looks like he's about to break, he launches a bayonet charge. We'll talk about that in a bit. Van Damme is one of the characters from the Napoleonic Wars that I love the best. Napoleon once said of him, if I was going to lead an army into hell, Van Damme would lead my vanguard. Um, he also said of him, if I had two of you, I would have to hang one. Um, <laughs> he's, a, he's a hard charger. He, he, he demanded not only that his troops be well-trained, but that they actually hate the enemy. And it was something he looked for. Um, and he had spent two years, remember, in Boulogne, turning his division into what Napoleon recognized was a killing machine. These are the two divisions that are going to go up the Pratson Heights. Linus is going to hold the flank. More than hold it, he will attack. He'll have to hold that Bagration's 13,000 troops marching down from the north, uh, northeast. Bessieres has the guard, the, the, the old guard, the guard cavalry, and Bernadotte is still coming up. He, well, most of him is up, but he's behind the lines in um, the flank. Murat has most of the um, Napoleonic cavalry here in the center. The Russians are attacking in four, what they call four columns. You can see their key commanders are listed there. They all move on to the Pratson Heights, and they move off the Pratson Heights. Um, when the battle starts, Napoleon actually goes to Salt. How long will it take you to get up to Pratson? And the Salt gives him his answer, and Napoleon says, all right, then we'll wait another 20 minutes at this point. Napoleon, you've got to stop for a minute and think about what Napoleon is seeing. An entire Russian army moving against his weakened flank. And he has enough command or intelligence or whatever it takes on a battlefield to fully comprehend what he's looking at and say, in 20 minutes, there'll be enough of them off the Pratson that I can move you up there and break the, uh, the Russian army. I believe uh, a lot of books have made this seem a lot easier fight than it was. It got pretty desperate up there. Now we'll go to the fight. The fight I starts- Let me just add, in terms of Napoleon's generalship, is the capacity to put, if you will, a very complex nonlinear equation of the other forces, my forces, the terrain, and how they would potentially interact um, over the course of a battle. And nobody clearly in warfare could do that any better than Napoleon as he showed right through to the very end. Um, the 1813 campaign, early 1814, may have been his best in some ways because he doesn't have the same capabilities of troops. But um, this capacity to, to keep all of these very complex factors working in his mind and figuring out what happens is, is incredible. Okay. <clears throat> the battle opens up with uh, a massive assault on Telnitz. Uh, unbelievably, the regiment that's in there, and I forget which one it was, 14th or the 24th of the line. Um, one regiment, that's right, one regiment. One regiment holds, counterattacks, continues to hold, for over an hour, they're inflicting incredible casualties on the Russians as they come up. They're fighting as a combined arms force of artillery and uh, and um, artillery and infantry, and the Russians are just coming at and Austrians, to his, some of them are just coming at them as if uh, I, I don't want to say mass attacks, but it really comes off as that. And they eventually have to give up Telnitz and. Uh, just just as they give it up, Freon's lead troops begin to arrive, and he organizes a counterattack, and Telnitz swaps hands a couple of times during the course of the morning. But even while the Battle of Telnitz is going on, 
Sokolitz Castle and the town and the, is it, they call it a pe peasantry, the hunt, you know, little place, I guess they keep uh, live, I don't know, not livestock, but um, uh, uh, food, growing, gardening, becomes a massive uh, battle as Freon's division enters the, enters the fight in mass. Uh, they're outnumbered approximately 10 to one overall but they're fighting behind uh, walls. They're fighting inside of uh, of uh, hedges and bushes and uh, and orchards. They're able to hold so the town of Solins. The castle itself is virtually impregnable at this point. And uh, this is a hard and desperate fight, with the Vaux is completely outnumbered for most of it, and holds. This this is the I say this is the decisive moment because if he fails. Then what you're going to get is just a, a reverse. Napoleon will crush this flank. The the, the uh, Russians will crush Napoleon's right flank, and the battle will switch. You know, 180 degrees, and Napoleon's going to find himself cut off from Vienna, and in a world of hurt, with no supplies and uh, food running short. Even as that battle is continuing in the south, Hilaire's division and Van Damme's division move up. Saul commands this force. Um, what, what I find astounding, and maybe Mike can help me with this, is I've read a lot of stuff about the fight on Pratson, and, I, you know, and uh, it doesn't seem Salt was there. I don't know where he vanished. Hilaire and Theobald, and I probably pronounced that wrong, Theobald wrote a great history of this fight, and he says they looked around for Salt and couldn't find him. I, yeah, I no, nobody really knows where he was. Yeah. I, I, I assume Salt, who was not a coward, you don't become a marshal in the French army by being... No, know, Salt was a very good marshal. I, I, I got to believe he was probably somewhere between Napoleon's headquarters and his, his frontline units. Yeah, right. I hope so. Um, yeah. <laughs> and maybe he found a little, a frawline. The... Uh, the Russians, they, there's a great, I'm gonna let Mike tell when the emperor, the Russian emperor finally, you know, someone brings to his attention, they, is uh, troops marching out of the mist. The bright sun of Austerlitz is about to show up, burn off all of the fog, and as the fog dissipates, there's two full divisions in column marching up onto the Pratsu. You want yeah. But, but the, he, uh, Alexander does commit his guard and that's, I think, what you're talking about, Jim. Uh, the brutal fighting up on top of the, on top of the Pratsen was between uh, the Russian Imperial Guard and um, and the French infantry. And uh, once the French Imperial Guard attack as well, then Alexander commits his his guard cavalry, and it's very brutal fighting, as you pointed out earlier. Okay, so Saint Hilaire basically gets Pratt's, gets Pratson, gets the high, gets the town of Pratson, and then wheels in this direction because the Russians stop some of that. They, they don't all get down here into this fight. Kohlwerf is, is able to turn some of them around and launches massive counterattacks at St. Hilaire, who, ba who was attacking and then realizes he can't attack anymore. There's just too many Russians coming at him stops his forces, puts them online, brings his artillery forward. Um, and we're only talking about eight guns. He has them double shotted with canisters, tells them not to fire into the Russians who are within 40 yards, and then just unleashes. Follows out of a bayonet attack that breaks the Russian forces on uh, that section of the Pratson. As the, um, Alexander is now almost ready to leave the battlefield. Kusinov is still in the area. He's slightly wounded. He's got a grazed cheek, which seems to have bled a lot. The, the emperor actually sent his private doctor over to take care of him. Um, the, or, the, the Van Damme is advanced. He doesn't see anything. He's not in this fight that St. Hilaire is, is involved in until he gets past the Pratson, right about to where I'm, I am here. He stops one small counterattack from the Kalworth's column. And then, as Mike said, the guard is unleashed, and it's just several regiments of the guard, but they're fighting a fanatic, and he puts his men into the brushes, and they, um, they hold very well. They inflict incredible amounts of casualties. 
until the God Cavalry is released. And it's not the entire God Cavalry, it's a, it's a section of it. And they cut down one of his regiments and, and he, starts to, he starts to fall back. And Napoleon orders, burn it off forward. He, he, he turns to Bessier because Napoleon right now is here. He is watching the Lannis troops pull back. Some of them have been routed. And they're, they're swarming past the emperor. And out of habit, as they go past them, they go, Viva la Emperor. And they keep going. And the, even Napoleon can't rally. He, he tells it, just let him go. Tells his staff, just let him go. They're, they're useless. They won't get back into the fight. He orders Bessier to charge with the cavalry. And that breaks that part of the Russian, Russian assault. The, the imperial cavalry, the god cavalry, does a massive, massive, uh, comes in and swarms, masses against the Russians. The Russians can't, don't have time to form squares. They're disordered from their victory. Um, they're, they're, they're easy prey for the cavalry. The cavalry doesn't go too far because there's still Russian cavalry here that counterattacks and drives them back. But then this battle basically comes to an end. When the emperor is leaving, most of his force, whatever's left of it is pulling out as Van Damme and St. Hilaire begin their advance again. Napoleon is about to turn them 180 degrees because the bulk of the Russian army and the Austrian army is down in here. Sorry. What's left is the guard of the Constantine, which comes forward. Bernadotte sends an aide, not Bernadotte, Napoleon sends an aide to Bernadotte, move up, take on the guard, it's coming. The guy, Constantine is the brother of the Tsar. He commands the whole guard. Bernadotte, is so untrustworthy, he turns to his best aide, Cigar, I'm probably pronouncing that wrong too. Uh, he says, go back, go with, go up there and deliver that message again and stay there and make sure Bernadotte does his job. Uh, this is, you know, staff officers in the Napoleonic era had the ability to move corps and divisions for better or worse. Um, pushes Bernadotte into the assault. Bernadotte's troops have not been in any fighting yet, all through the campaign of any note. They're like eager to go. They push the guard back. And then short of Austerlitz, Bernadotte sits the troops down. Napoleon, when he learns this, is furious because if he had gotten on this road, this is an easy march. This is a 20 minute march to close down the road and trap the rest of the Russian army. It could, it, nothing would have left the Austerlitz battlefield. This defeat was catastrophic for the Russians already. If Bernadotte had pushed onto this road junction up here, it would have all been over. He broke through. He was on the edge of Auslitz and he stopped. He did not want to go forward anymore. Even as that is all happening, Lannis and Marat are attacking Marat with cavalry. He's hitting the guard cavalry. Um, it's, it, it, to read these stories is just great. General Exelman's leading cavalry charge after cavalry charge, uh, swarming cavalry battles as Lannis is veteran Red divisions, and I, and I use the word, it's it veteran divisions, but this is a new, newish core. Only one of the divisions in this core is what he actually started out with. He's got a pickup team here, but Bagration's forces are no match for him. They, they are Russian, they are stubborn, they, they retreat slowly, but by the time, uh, by, by one o'clock in the afternoon, this is a beaten force here. Lannis is advancing, the Russians are pulling out. St. Hilaire, Bernadotte, the right, all of Salt's core, Bernadotte's core, are told turn towards the south and wipe out this army here. This army breaks. The bow hits them from the front. Salt's hitting them on the flank, and they start running. And there's all the stories that come after this that um, the they fired the artillery on the pond and things along that line. I, it's, it, it, some of this is they missed. drained. They drained that uh, pond and found uh, four or five skeletons. Yeah, uh, but they have they have descriptions of guys saying six thousand and ten. Yeah, you know, one one description. Yeah. six thousand Russians going on there. Another has between eleven and twelve thousand. Um, yeah. unless those were some really hungry fish that eat bones, it didn't. <laughs> um, this. Um, whatever did, went this way, and it was probably in the area of 18,000 troops. That's a broken force. It is, their, their leadership went towards Olmitz, and this force went towards, I guess, Prague is in this direction. 
Um, that's a broken force. It is never going to reassemble. Uh, that is the end of the Battle of Austerlitz. It's considered Napoleon's masterpiece. And, um, and uh, Austria pulls out of the coalition soon thereafter. Um, Russia goes back to lick its wounds. And Napoleon starts reforming the Grand Army for the 1806 campaign, uh, Jena Austat, which we'll have to wait to next academic year. This will be the last corner corner of the year. And uh, EWS has already graduated. Everybody, as I said earlier, everybody else is getting ready to graduate, move, and everything else. So I think we will end it here. And we just might say, Jim, Jim, we might say the implications, of course, of Austerlitz were summed up by Pitt.